Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul, for that uh, introduction. And uh, I can say I'm very pleased that uh, I was invited by uh, Act for Canada to come and speak about uh, refugee policy. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I spent a good part of my life dealing with refugee issues from the Hungarian uh, uprising back in 1956. Uh, I was standing at the Union Station in Toronto receiving these young people who were coming direct from Hungary and trying to get them oriented and settled in in Toronto. Uh, I was around when the Czech refugee movement took place. I was whitewashing my back fence and got a call from external affairs to come in because the minister of the day, Mitchell Sharp, wanted to make an announcement about <coughs> Canada taking Czech refugees. And so uh, I ended up there. But I've been involved in all of the, pretty well all of the movements of refugees to Canada. The big one, the Vietnamese refugee movement, when it took place after the fall of Saigon and uh, Canadians rose up to the challenge of accepting people of whom they knew very little uh, to come to Canada as refugees. So I'm really delighted that uh, Valerie Price and Paul invited me to come out and speak to you because uh, refugee policy is not only topical today, <clears throat> it's very important. And we've seen what's happening on a daily basis in Europe where thousands upon thousands, probably now at least a million uh, so-called refugees uh, from the Middle East, mainly from the conflict in Syria, but not only uh, Syrians, many Afghans, uh, many people from Kosovo and other parts of the world have jumped on the bandwagon and are pouring into Europe at a very rapid pace. Uh, I consider it to be basically a failure of political leadership on the part of the uh, European leaders, and particularly uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany, who is in her mistaken belief that she's acting in a humanitarian fashion is in fact acting against the interests of her own people and of Germany. And if uh, this flow of people, this outpouring uh, of people into Europe is not stopped and stopped very quickly, uh, the European Union is, is already destabilized and is apt to fall apart. I see it quite frankly as the beginning of a mass movement uh, of people into the developed countries coming from the what we used to call the third world. Uh, if you're poor and hungry and have no hope for your children or yourself and you're plagued by violence and killing, can't see any future, there's an iron root rule of immigration and that is that you will move and you will try and get to a place that where you can lead a better life. Nobody should condemn you for that, but on the other hand, the receiving country has a responsibility to manage these movements in such a way that their own countries do not become threatened and their culture overrun. And that's what's happening in Europe. Uh, I'm going to speak a bit about that today. Unfortunately, <clears throat> politicians today seem to want votes more than they want to do what's in the interest of the country. And that certainly applies to our own political leaders. Uh, really since the beginning of the 90s, We've had massive large movements of migrants to Canada and as refugees as well. And uh, there has been no discussion about this. There's been no public debate. Uh, the media is supportive of uh, what I call mass migration. And so are all of the political parties. So are the banks. So are the real estate agents. So are uh, business generally. And all of the media is supportive. But no one talks about what are the consequences of this and is this large-scale immigration to our country helpful to us? We, are, are, we argue <coughs> at times that we need immigrants for the aging of our population, but that's simply a false assumption. It's been proven completely incorrect and false by innumerable studies by economists and demographers. Uh, immigrants get old as well by lowering or by raising the retirement age by two years as the former government did you can solve the problem without bringing millions of people here uh, we've been told that the uh, uh, immigrants help our economy but every study that's been done not only in canada but throughout the world 
has disproved that theory. Immigrants don't necessarily uh, help the economy. They make it a bit larger, but they don't really increase the GDP or the living standard of the people in the country. Uh, we're told that uh, uh, we need diversity and uh, inclusiveness. But the fact of the matter is all of the studies on diversity and inclusiveness have also proven that it doesn't really help unify a country. It does the opposite. So a lot of the myths about immigration have to be talked about, discussed, and debated. But we don't hear any of that. Uh, the politicians can get away without discussing these sensitive issues because they keep you ill-informed, they keep the public ill-informed. And the complicit in this is the media. There is very little discussion about immigration or refugee issues. That's why I'm happy tonight to talk to you about refugee policy. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that uh, the orderly movement of refugees is critically important. And the basis of whether a country will accept refugees or not depends entirely on whether the public, the masses of the people, will accept them. And that was uh, something that Canada learned very early in the game. We selected our immigrants on the basis of their skills and their training and their ability to contribute to Canada, either in its labor force and in other ways. And we did the same with refugees. Uh, and it started, I'm going to start at the uh, end of the Second World War. Because, uh, but before I do that, I want to, to get everybody clear on the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker. Most Canadians don't know the difference between the two. Most of the media do not make a difference between the two. And it's critically important for you to understand that because today and tomorrow you'll be reading about refugees, but they're not refugees. They're more likely to be asylum seekers. And I'll explain the difference between that. An asylum, a refugee is someone who has met the definition of the United Nations Convention definition of a refugee. Uh, and that, that has only been uh, able to be done by a body authorized to make that decision as to whether someone who claims to be a refugee meets the UN definition or does not meet it. And that in Canada is done by the Immigration and Refugee Board. It's the authority that makes that decision. It's a quasi-judicial decision and the definition is not an easy one to make. Uh, it says that anyone, is, uh, someone who is a refugee is anyone who owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or membership in a particular social group or political opinion is outside of the country, his or her country, and is unable or owing to such a fear unwilling to return. That's the definition, not easy to make. Uh, it's a definition that was debated and discussed for many, many, many months in the United Nations in 1946-1947. And that's a definition that makes what, what we know as, as a refugee. An asylum seeker is not a refugee. An asylum seeker is someone who's come into your country and claims to be a refugee. And then you have to have a judicial hearing to determine whether or not he meets the UN definition that I just mentioned to you. And it's not an easy definition to meet. And by far 60, 70, 80 percent of the people who come here claiming to be refugees are not refugees. They're asylum seekers. When they go before the IRB, it's found that they don't have a genuine claim. But in the meantime, we've got them and it's extremely difficult to get rid of them. And I'll have more to say about that as I go along. But going back to the history, at the end of the Second World War, there were many millions of people who had been displaced by the war living in Western European countries. Uh, they were fleeing not only the conflict of the Second World War, but they were also fleeing the, uh, the Russians who had taken over many of their countries. These millions of people were not considered by the United Nations to be refugees, but something had to be done with them. And the job was handed over to the United Nations. And they decided, after great debate and discussion, 
1951 to create the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee Office with a High Commissioner appointed and with the responsibility of the UN to look after genuine refugees. At the same time, this left out many thousands of people in Europe who had been displaced by the war but who were not able to meet that UN definition. They didn't want to go back uh, and they, some of them feared to go back, but not because they were or feared persecution individually. Uh, some of them did and those that did would meet the UN definition. But the many other thousands of displaced people, uh, there was another organization that was set up to deal with those and it was called the Intergovernmental Committee of European Migration. And that body was to look after people who were displaced but who were not refugees. And that organization still exists today. Indeed, I worked for it for five years in Russia uh, several years ago. It's called the International Organization for Migration. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, thousands upon thousands of ethnic Russians returned to Mother Russia. They were not refugees, but they had been displaced and an organization had to help get them settled in Russia and IOM did that job. IOM today is very active actually in Syria, in Jordan, with helping the UN deal with people that have been displaced. The UN <coughs> High Commissioner for Refugees was established in 1951 uh, and uh, Canada did, although Canada had a role in, in uh, drafting the convention, uh, Canada did not sign it in 1951. Uh, we were concerned that by signing that, then the refugees that were coming to Canada uh, would not be selected by our officers and our public servants, but by the United Nations. And we decided as a result of that not to sign the convention. And actually we didn't sign it until uh, 1969. In the meantime, we did, however, play a very active role in helping deal with refugees. And the way we did it was to select refugees from camps in Europe mainly, at that time, uh, that we thought could come to Canada because they had skills of training, education, uh, language abilities in some cases, that if they came here, they could get established in about one year on their own with very little government help. And we took, in those early years, from 1949, 1950, right up until uh, uh, 19, well, I guess 1969 when we signed the convention, we took close to 200,000 displaced people from Europe. We, we played that role uh, with the full uh, compliance and consent of the UN and the High Commissioner for Refugees. We called it burden sharing. We did not think in the early years that we would be a country of first asylum. Geographically, the only country that might provide us with asylum seekers would be the United States, and that was highly unlikely. But we wanted to help solve refugee problems, and therefore we decided to go into these camps, select refugees that came to Canada. And it was done in a fairly selfish way. We selected the, uh, the refugees. We did not take the sick, the maimed, or the blind. We left them in the camps. And we did that for two reasons. One, we took, by taking refugees that were able-bodied and were able to come and make a home for themselves here, we could take many, many thousands of them. Uh, and the other reason is most of the refugees, and even today, tend to be younger people because the old and the sick can't get out. And if they get out, they can't travel. They have to stay in the camps. Uh, we contributed money to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, but our main role was to go into the camps and resettle refugees in Canada. Why? Because we at that time needed immigrants, and we didn't really make much distinction between immigrants and refugees. And we took our immigrants for the same reasons. We took them for very selfish reasons. They were selected carefully. They were interviewed, examined. If they had trades that they could come here and get a job, we took them. If they had education and had the potential of helping us, we took them. And that's what was the basis of our refugee movement, uh, right up, I would say, until uh, the 90s, the early 90s. Uh, during that period of time, uh, having gone into the camps and taken out many, many refugees who had been displaced by the war, we continued 
the reputation of, of becoming a country of first asylum, uh, first settlement, and we uh, we took thousands more from, as I mentioned, Hungary, some 37,000, Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, 12,000, 12 or 13,000, Uganda in 1972, seven to 10,000, China, uh, sorry, Chile in 1973, we took 7,000, 8,000, Indochina from 75 to 86, uh, we took close to 100,000 refugees from Vietnam. Uh, Lebanon, in, from 76 to 79, we took 11,000, and the most, almost the most recent one, Kosovo, about 5,000. And then today, we're taking refugees from Syria. We already have 25,000, and the government seems to be thinking of maybe adding another 25,000. That's a lot of people, 50,000 people. And I, I have some quite frankly concerns about that because uh, what happened, as you all know, is when the little boy and three-year-old in the red sweater was washed up, drowned on the beach in Turkey, uh, the photograph moved a lot of people to feel they had a responsibility to help. And uh, that enabled people in Canada, because of our policy, to privately sponsor refugees if if they had a group of people who were willing to look after these people when they got here. But it also happened, that, as you know, during an election campaign. And having seen the little boy and the shock that that, shock waves that that sent around the world, and in Canada too, our political parties started to bid on how many more they could take than the other party, and how fast we could get them here. And that ended up with the decision, as you know, by the present government of, of taking 10,000 before Christmas, leaving us about six weeks to do that, which was impossible, and then saying 25,000 by the end of February, which was also able to be done, but at a fearful price. Because as I said, if you take refugees, you have to be able to look after them properly. And the idea of flying them out of camps and getting them to Canada as quickly as possible has overburdened the agencies and the church groups and others who are looking after these people. We simply don't have the housing. Someone told me the other day that there's 30-some thousand people in Ottawa on social housing, and the waiting list is 10,000. That's before refugees come into Ottawa at all. But putting in 25,000 in a month is a foolish decision, and it, it runs the risk of turning the Canadian people uh, against refugees, which would be a shame. But that's the way it happens. As a matter of fact, there was no rush because none of the refugees that have come to Canada from Syria were in any danger. Indeed, they had received protection and safety in Jordan and in uh, Lebanon. We didn't and haven't taken any out of Turkey, but even the ones that got to Turkey got, are safe. Many of the people that we've taken have been in Jordan or in Lebanon for two or three years. Uh, the conditions were not that good but their life was not in danger and they were safe there. And we were in a rush to get them out and when they get here, we're putting them in camps, which is not going to be a healthy thing to do for them. Anyway, as a result of our actions through and after the post-war period, right up until 19, in the 80s, uh, we, won we won a lot of acclaim around the world for doing what we were doing with refugees and most of the critics uh, realized in the long run that our policies were well founded and were working. We never had any backlash against refugees in Canada. We never had any uh, firebombs thrown at, at camps where some of the refugees were residing. The people accepted them and accepted them primarily because they f fitted in very quickly and took jobs and got working and on their own. Uh, the United Nations ordered, awarded Canada the Nansen Prize in 1986 for the contribution that it had made to world uh, refugee problems. Uh, no other country in the world has received that award, and it was well earned. I mentioned that we didn't sign the convention until 1969, for the, and I gave you the reasons that we wanted to select our own refugees. Uh, but in the early 60s, there was more pressure was building up, particularly from our foreign affairs people, that uh, 
we should join more multilateral organizations and be more supportive of the UN. And uh, there was pressure to, to sign the convention. We did so finally then in 1969, but it wasn't until 1976 with a new immigration act that came about in on that year that we incorporated the word refugee in our legislation. Up until that point, refugee was not mentioned in any of our Canadian legislation. In 1976, we incorporated the UN Convention definition in our legislation. It is still there. Uh, also, in 1976, Canada was beginning to get asylum seekers arriving. And I want to talk a little bit about that because we had originally thought we were safe but with modern air transportation and problems in Central America, we suddenly found ourselves in the 1980s on the receiving end of a growing number of people who were simply coming to Canada and applying for refugee status and claiming they were refugees. So again, in the 1970 Act, 76 Act, we had to incorporate in the Act and the legislation a procedure for dealing with these people. A quasi-judicial uh, hearing was necessary because we also had, uh, by that time, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter of Rights and Freedoms obliged us to deal with each one of these people who came, claiming to be refugees, to give them a quasi-judicial hearing with lawyers. And that, that decision takes a long time. And when we started getting people in the thousands, and I'm going to give you some figures here that you've probably never heard about, but they are quite shocking. Uh, if I can find my notes here. Yeah, uh, the movement started about 1985. We had about 3,000 come. By 1987, we had 7,000 coming. And uh, it just kept growing, kept growing. So what, what we had finally was uh, uh, I'll give you just a couple of numbers here. In 1991, we had 67,000 claims. 67,000 people walked into Canada or flew in or came by boat claiming to be refugees. And we had to give them all a quasi-judicial hearing with refugees. And if they weren't, uh, uh, if they didn't have a hearing, they could, some of them had to wait two years for their hearing. In the meantime, uh, the government supported them with housing, accommodation, with health, and with uh, uh, money, uh, 67,000 in 1991, uh, 42,000 in 1994, 55,000 in 1995, 58,000 in 1998, 37,000 in 2001. So in other words, from 1985 until uh, that time, till about 2001, we'd had roughly a million asylum seekers in the country. And very few people knew anything about that. And the government that received them uh, didn't say anything about that. And the costs were enormous. I calculated on an in-depth study I did for the Frontier College in Winnipeg that in one year, 2008, it probably cost us about a billion dollars to look after the, uh, in that one year. And that, that number has been, that financial figure has been supported. Uh, so an approximate cost of a billion dollars to look after them. Uh, the government itself admitted uh, in a document that a failed asylum seeker cost $60,000. And you know, we had 60% of those coming were found not to be genuine refugees. So at enormous cost to keep that going. Why? Uh, because there was a very, and still is, a very powerful uh, refugee lobby in Canada. It consists of uh, uh, NGOs who are very active in looking after and supporting refugees, church groups who for religious reasons want to see and help people, uh, immigration lawyers who make a lot of money defending these people before the courts because these people don't have the money to do that, so you know who's paying for it, you are. Uh, and others who, who genuinely want to help refugees but don't know the difference between an asylum seeker and a refugee. Uh, in 2008, for example, we received 37,000 asylum seekers. And the backlog before the IRB at that time was over 60,000. 
So we get another 37,000 to add to that background. Now, who do you think were in that 37,000 in 2008? Well, there were citizens of 188 different countries around the world coming in. Coming in from Brazil, coming in from uh, the Caribbean, coming in from Portugal, coming in from you name it. Well, 188 different countries. Among them were claimants from 22 of the 27 countries of the European Union. 22. We had asylum claims from Swedes, from Swiss, from Frenchmen. And in that year, we had 2,305 claims made by citizens of the United States. Some of them draft dodgers, well, not draft dodgers in, in 2007, I'm getting mixed up. We had lots of draft dodgers earlier than that. And, but in uh, 2001, or 2008, many of the claims from the Americans were from young people from California who uh, said they weren't able to smoke pot in, the, in that state. That was their refugee claim. But whether they met their definition or not wasn't of interest to most of these people. They wanted into a developed country and we let them in. And it wasn't until, uh, I guess it was 2010, I think it was, that the previous government, the conservative government, under the leadership of Kenny, Jason Kenny, was able to put that reform through. And even then, it meant, terif it meant terrific opposition in the House of Commons. Uh, and the refugee groups and the organizations that look after refugees lobbied extremely hard to stop that bill from getting through. And the only reason it got through is he did include, it included it in a, in a uh, uh, what do you call it, Margaret, you know, an omnibus bill. So if they'd have defeated it, it would have, it meant, it would have probably meant another election. So that reform was essential. But what was damaging with the asylum seekers is that they replaced the refugees. Because we were expending so much uh, of our money and effort on looking after asylum seekers, we did very little in those years to really help the UNHCR in resettling refugees, genuine refugees from the camps. And they were the ones that suffered. And this is the dark side of our refugee policy uh, from the, in the 90s and the 2000s. We weren't helping the right people. Uh, now that, I hope, has changed, but we have to keep an eye on it because the refugee lobby is still very powerful and very strong. And the Canadian public, the masses, you people, other people, know nothing about it. And the media solidly supports the refugee lobby, solidly. And again, there is never any discussion about the policy. If you listen to the CBC, and it's repeated almost every day, we're getting sob stories about refugee, individual refugees. Uh, and they come on, they talk to them, why they came, what they're doing, how they're getting along, how much they love us, uh, but never a discussion of why. Why are we taking 25,000 or 50,000 refugees? The UNHCR itself has made it pretty clear that Third country resettlement is not the solution, or not the favored solution, for resolving refugee problems. The best solution is to keep them in a region close to the country from which they fled, and hopefully look after them until they can return home. And only in dire circumstances should you take them out of their country. Uh, and that's why I said earlier where there was no great rush to bring these people here, and many of them will have a very difficult time because they were not selected on the basis of whether coming here they could get established on their own. They were first come, first serve. And they were, many of them were uh, women without a partner, without a husband, with four or five children. The language is different, the religion is different, the customs, traditions are different. Uh, Europe has been criticized for, for not absorbing many of the immigrants that are living in the suburbs, the Muslim from North Africa who came there and has settled there. And Germany and France and others are criticized for not integrating these people. But there's a two sides to that story. Uh, most of the European countries are highly technical industrial countries now. You need to be able to read and write. You need to know arithmetic, basic arithmetic, to work in most of the occupations. And many of the people that are coming from the Middle East and from North Africa don't have that education. They don't. Some do, some are brilliant, but the masses of them don't. And that's part of the problem with their integration. They have to take the lowest end jobs, 
and it's extremely difficult then to, to move ahead. That's a problem I think we will find with the 50,000, if it reaches that number, of the Syrian refugees. They'll be with us for a very long time, and it will be very costly, extremely costly. Uh, in the meantime, they're not the only refugees in the world. And while, while we were spending, as I mentioned, a billion dollars a year on asylum seekers uh, back at 2008, guess what we were giving to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to look after 46 some million real refugees in refugee camps uh, under his jurisdiction. We gave them 43 million dollars, that's all, a pittance. And yet we boasted about what we were doing for refugees, we still do. Well, uh, as I said, the system was dysfunctional. I appeared regularly before parliamentary committees arguing that the whole thing was a mess and it should be corrected. Uh, anything I said was never reported. Others, uh, Martin Collicott and other groups, and Margaret, who's here tonight, Margaret Coppola, uh, said the same things, but uh, voice crying in the wilderness, as indeed is Act for Canada. Until we do more, as Paul, Paul has said, we act. We have to start acting because you have never had or heard a policy discussion on immigration in our parliament. Uh, they go ahead and do whatever they want to do, and the people of Canada have no say in the matter. That's what the crime is. It's not that we should or should not take refugees. It's if we are going to take masses of refugees and immigrants, uh, then the people of Canada should have some say in the matter. Uh, now, uh, I probably should stop at that point. Uh, I, I have some other things I could say. I mean. The, elephant in the room with the Syrian refugees and people are afraid to say anything about it uh, except people who get to come to speak to you on Act Canada, I'm sure, uh, is that they are all Sunni Muslims. And we know from what's happened in Europe that large-scale Muslim immigration into Europe has not worked very well. Uh, uh, in England, there are large swaths of England that are no-zone areas that are occupied by Muslims where Sharia law is being followed. And the same in France, the same in Sweden, the same wherever these people have gone. Uh, again, it's a generalization, but it, it appears that Muslim integration into the European of Western Europe ha has not worked well. And we should be guarding about that. We should be talking about that. We should be having discuss discussions about that with our own Muslims in Canada. Uh, about what do they think? How, how are we going to get these people integrated? Uh, how are you going to get them to accept, accept the fact that in this new country of ours, uh, there's such a thing as gay marriage. There's such a thing as, as freedom of speech in the newspapers. And if you draw a cartoon, people don't pour out on the streets and kill over it. Uh, we know from our own Muslim communities that many of the Muslims uh, in Canada are concerned about what's happening here and around the world, naturally. But no one's having a dialogue with them. And our politicians will not mention the word Muslim or Islam. Uh, Patrick Grady, who's just done a, a, an excellent study on, on Muslim immigration and its correlation by the more Muslims that you have in a country, the more terrorist acts co are committed. And uh, uh, that study will be published, but no one will read it. It won't be covered by the CBC. It won't be reported in any of our national newspapers. And it's a serious study by a very moderate man, but an excellent economist. He's certainly not a racist. Uh, he's not an extreme right-wing uh, nutcase. As, as anybody who speaks out against Im about immigration or refugee issues are immediately branded as right-wing and extreme. Uh, that's, that's got to stop. Uh, People have the right to know what's happening to their country and whether their traditions, their culture, their way of life might be threatened by so many people coming in. Uh, Canada takes immigration at a rate that no other country in the world takes. And now we've bumped it up to 800,000 people. 800,000 every year. Uh, why? Uh, Patrick Grady, in his study on, on uh, Muslims and integration and the demography of that, has got some interesting figures here. I don't know if I can find them. Uh, I, I jotted a few of them down, which, which uh, you might want to know. Uh, yeah, uh, 
our Muslim population in uh, 2001 was 579,640. Uh, that was in 19, uh, 2001. It represented about 2% of our population. I'll repeat that figure. 579,000 Muslims, half a million, a little over half a million. <laughs> In 2012, it had risen to 1,053,945, or 3.2% of our population. That's an enormous rise. That's an 80-some percent increase in a very short period of time. And these figures don't take into account the last three years, uh, well, 2013, 14, 15. And it's not going to count the 300-some thousand immigrants we bring in today, and roughly speaking, about a quarter of the immigrants that we bring are Muslims, coming direct from Muslim countries, where we know they have problems. Uh, Pakistan is at the top, Iran comes second, then quickly followed by other Muslim countries. The figures that, that uh, uh, Mr. Grady has done here, I don't think would, I think they're figures of Muslims who come direct from Muslim countries. Uh, but. We are getting also thousands of Muslim immigrants from France, from England, and from other parts of the world that are not Muslim countries. So these are low estimate figures. Uh, now, also, what's, what's happening here, and we don't hear much about it, but when you bring someone to Canada as a refugee or an immigrant, they can also bring their relatives here very quickly afterwards. And although the conservative government put a bit of a cap on the people bringing their parents and grandparents here because they're aged, they're getting as old as I am, and they will be needing medical attention and care. And it costs a lot. Uh, we hear every day about our health system. Uh, and so there was a cap put on the number of parents and grandfathers, but that cap on bringing parents and grandparents has now been lifted by the new government. So we will probably have, I think, 85 to 90,000 parents and grandparents included in that 300,000 coming here. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you really want people to come and integrate, uh, and there's a, a debate about that. Some people feel that people who come here should not uh, integrate into our value system. Some think they should continue with their own culture and their own traditions. Uh, it's, uh, but again, uh, does anybody debate that? No. We are, we are just told that we are a country that is inclusive and it is diverse and we want that to continue. And uh, I'm not sure everybody agrees with that. I don't particularly agree with it. I'd like to debate it. Uh, because all, again, all of the studies done by sociologists at Harvard and el elsewhere and in England has shown that diversity and inclusiveness doesn't work. It undermines the national character of the people, their traditions and their history. And we see that happening today in our newspapers. John A. MacDonald, that we used to look upon as our first prime minister, they won't have a monument put up to him in the park in Waterloo, Kitchener, because some associate professor at the university said he committed crimes against the Aboriginal people. Uh, you know, we, we have, Canadians have this tremendous guilt complex that we're Canadians and we should feel guilty about it. Uh, and I think we should get over that and we're proud of <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> who we are and what we are. And the only way to do that is uh, take the lead and do some, some talking. and Get in touch with your member of parliament, phone in on the CBC call lines, and raise a bit of hell. Otherwise, uh, you, we're going to remain the silent majority uh, that will watch uh, changes taking place in our country and just nod to our politicians and say, keep on going, boys. Uh, we're paying you, and you're really not doing much for us. Anyway, thank you. I'll answer a question. <laughs> I'm happy to take uh, questions either on immigration or refugee issues.